Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher. I hope everyone's doing well. This is our 138th episode of the CodeCast today, and we have been dealing with all kinds of things in our country right now, counting the days for the country to reopen, and it looks like it is really heading in that direction. We're already in phase three, heading to phase four here in California, and I know a lot of states are reopening uh, pretty well. I know that uh, some of the elective surgeries have finally gotten on the schedules, and um, invoices are being paid, and everybody's basically uh, really happy to get back to work. I know I've heard from a lot of coders and billers and administrators saying, yes, we're actually back to a full-time staff just to get things up and running. So that's a good thing. Uh, Unfortunately, we had to deal with a lot of some of the unrest from some of the unfortunate uh, crimes that have been uh, committed. And there's been, you know, quiet protests, which is your, uh, you know, constitutional right, but also some looting and rioting, which is absolutely not appropriate and criminal. And we just had a lot of unrest. And and I'm sorry if anybody's having to deal with that. Uh, We also had an earthquake here in central California this week. So I don't know about you guys, but I am ready for a vacation. And no, quarantine is not a vacation, just a change of scenery. I'm sure you agree. But hopefully uh, this week we'll settle things down. We'll have some tensions that have kind of, um, I hate to use the word flatten the curve, but hopefully things are just heading back to what we remember as normal. I don't like the word new normal, but hopefully we're headed into a more positive week, month, and rest of the year. We have seen an uptick in um, the the stock market and the economy and also in the job market. And so I'm trying to be as positive as possible. I am pretty excited about hopefully the future and, uh, and hopefully everybody else is, is trying to do that as well. Also, I wanted to mention somebody had asked me, um, you know, are you open for business? We have never missed a beat at Terry Fletcher Consulting. Uh, We've been open for business without a gap. During the pandemic, we were able to pivot to remote working uh, with some of my subcontractors I use without any issues at all. We were ready for the pandemic. So 70% of my business is done remotely anyway, and 30% is on site. So it was not an issue. And I've been actually coming into my office every day, had to get a, I don't want to call it a waiver, but just like a certified letter letter from uh, my local Laguna Niguel city saying that I was an essential business. So I never had a problem with that. I think I've only had maybe four days off uh, total since uh, the beginning of March. So very busy time. Um, But if you need us, we're here. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Uh, Never had a uh, busier time than we've had in the last three months. So in saying that, today my topic is going to focus on the various funding that many of you have received to help uh, mitigate the pandemic losses on your businesses. And I wanted to make sure you as coders, billers, administrators, uh, financial staff, anybody really in the office and talking to your physicians and dealing with some of this information. I know most of you don't because it's an accounting situation, but I think it's important that at least you're aware of it and because it's in the news and you're going to see it all over, not just social media platforms but you're going to get emails on it. CMS, if you're on their mailing list, have been sending you emails as well. And so is HHS. And we're going to be, as as the company is opening up now, and we're going to be heading towards uh, recovery and trying to get things again back to a certain norm- normality of what we're used to, um, you really have to understand where some of this funding is came from what it was for and make sure you're not double dipping. I know some of you are very small practices and maybe, you know, the physician and the spouse runs the financials and they don't have what we call an accounting team. Um, I have an accounting team. I also have a legal team. And so, um, and I have a lot of healthcare CPAs and et cetera. If you ever need one, let me know and I can direct you in that right, right way. But there's a lot involved in the HHS and the OIG are now saying that they're all going to be doing audits now. So we want to make sure that at least you're aware of what it was and then making sure that you are documenting appropriately. So there are three main sources of funding for mitigating the impact of coronavirus and the pandemic. And this is what we're looking at here. Number one is called the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. So many of you received kind of what we call a dump into your account. And I remember around April 10th, I was getting all these emails from somebody saying, hey, we just got some money from our from the government. And it says HHS deposit and it comes with no check attachment, nothing. 
Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, there was good and bad news on this. The good news was that there was $30 billion that was automatically released around April 10th. And these payments were given to providers to be able to keep your doors open. But what you may not know is can you keep it? And that's the first thing. So these disbursements are grants. They're not loans that you don't have to pay them back. Well, they said that at first. They said, but wait, unless CMS or other federal agencies determine that after the fact, okay, so they're going to do a post oversight, that you are not entitled to it or spent it inappropriately. So CMS is now requiring that you also attest that you are eligible to receive the funds. And you had 30 days from the time that you received it. So at some point you had to sign that attestation um, that for the provider relief and sign off on it. Also, when you go in to sign off, it's the TIN, so the provider number, the employee ID number, that is under your practice. So if, if you belong to a group practice, it's not an f- individual physician. But what they gave you is they gave you a, an equivalent to about 6.2% of your fee-for-service reimbursements from 2019. I have no idea how they came up with that amount of money. But the fact sheet talks about this and it says you build Medicare in 2019. So here's what's interesting. Some physicians build Medicare in 2019, but then retired in 2020. They can't keep that money. The second thing on the fact sheet, it says that um, you provided after January 31st, 2020, that's when the PHE started, either diagnosis, testing, or care for individuals with COVID-19. So think about that if you're not an internal medicine or cardiology practice. Is currently active to participate with Medicare? Is it not excluded from any Medicare, Medicaid, or other government program? And you haven't had your billing privileges revoked in the last five years. Now, you don't have to go and take everybody's, you know, temperature and check on every patient to make sure that they were COVID. HHS says that everyone who came into your practice was a potential COVID patient because you didn't know if, even if they weren't sick, if they were asymptomatic, asymptomatic. So if there was a possibility at that that they were, and you sent them to a testing center or said, go back to your primary care physician, I'm just thinking of surgery practices that really didn't deal with COVID. Um, or if you gave them an instruction on how to get tested, you are covered under the grant. So you just have to make sure it's well documented. And that's the big thing. And then how can you spend it? So the funds specifies that payments are to be used for, okay, let me quote, used to prevent, prepare, and respond to coronavirus and can also be used for healthcare related expenses or lost revenues that are attributed to coronavirus. So if you had to shut down and you still had to pay leases, you still had to pay you know expenses for the business, then that is something you can um, look at. If you received over 150000 you're required to deliver a quarterly spending report to HHS. Make sure you're doing that because they'll take the money back if you did not do that. And make sure your accounting team is, is on that on top of that so your checks and balances um, are not offset later with they try to get the money back out of a, a check. Now, the biggest thing is you don't want to double dip. And what does that mean? Well, another one of the programs is called the Paycheck Protection Program from the CARES Act. Okay, so for this one, uh, they put out an additional $310 billion, and this was enacted on April 24th, and it was through the Small Business Administration. So basically, you go to your bank. I actually uh, asked for it as well, because we had one month that uh, we had slow invoices there. And what happened is uh, there's good and bad news. So basically, they said you have to be eligible and that anything, well, anything in excess of $2 million, can you imagine asking for that much? Um, You're going to be automatically audited, but you're also going to be audited if you are over, um, from what I'm told, over $200,000 as well. And they have the option to audit you uh, if you had anything over uh, $50,000. So I was way below that, so I didn't have to deal with that. But um, one of the things that comes out of this is that you had to spend, 75% and 75% on payroll and 25% could be only on your office lease or mortgage and then utilities which includes cell phone and if you and also internet since we had to expand the internet for telehealth but it doesn't include you know your physician's car payments and things like that and no uh, leases on equipment or anything like that that's what you would have spent the HHS on but let's say that you also use that HHS funding grant for payroll you can't double dip so this is where accounting and tracking all expenses and make sure you account 
account for all healthcare practice related expenses are important. And you have to show that you could not have paid them because of the pandemic. And so I think a lot of practices are thinking this is just huge free money and not having to be accountable. And that's a problem. So between the HHS CARES funding grant, and then the payment, a uh, paycheck protection program, and these are all grants. So they, they call them loans. But if you follow the rules, you can then get that loan forgiven. So what I did is when I got the PPP, I put it into a separate account, and made sure that just for for 60 days, that went to payroll only, and then also went to my office lease space, my utilities, and then oh, it also can go to interest on credit cards, but I don't keep balances on that. And then also then any uh, interest on credit cards that have to do with business expenses in those two months. And then also um, internet and cell phone. So they changed it just last week to be 60% go to payroll and they opened up a little bit of what you can spend on uh, expenses, or I should say the percentage on expenses, not really changing what that is. But here's the other thing. Again, don't double dip. Don't you say you did this for payroll and it also use this for payroll. You can't do that. You have to use one or the other and accounting has to be really stellar. But there was a third fund. Now, I discouraged any of my clients from even going down this road. But since the, it, I have to tell you what it was, and that's called the Medicare Accelerated and Advanced Payments Program, the AAP. Now, they halted it as of April 26 because people went crazy. They paid out over $175 billion on advanced Medicare payments. So first of all, this is a loan. Providers were eligible to receive advance payments up to three months worth of their usual Part B payments, and then they have to pay it back. Now, here's one of the things that maybe you don't know is that you can't write them a check. You can't get an extension. So what happens is that, and this is through, again, through the uh, CARES Act and through the flexibilities policy, payments will be required to be repaid. It's the only way they could open it up to CMS through offsets and future payments. And it starts the 120th day after receiving funds. So some people are starting in August. They're going to start seeing their Medicare checks for patients just now coming back into the office offset, talk about an accounting nightmare to t- pay back the this money. And so I hope you did not buy into this. I really hope you didn't do the advance payments. There was so much other money out there that you don't have to pay back as long as you accounted it correctly, that this is not the the place to go. So if you did, just know that you are going to be doing a lot of manual uh, inputting for money, and it does have to be paid back. So the advanced payments is not considered um, a, that it, that is considered a loan that is not considered a grant. But I just want to make sure you're aware of that because this has become such a sticking point for many practices that said, well, I didn't know that I thought everything was just I get to keep it. No, you don't get to keep everything. There were two uh, programs that you got to keep, which I think was very generous of the government. But this one you can't. So this is where you have to be very um, account forward and make sure that your your CPA, your accounting team, your legal team has everything separated out. So if you are an office manager that listens to the CodeCast, or if you're an administrator, or if you're somebody that, you know, talks to them, those people and talks to that department, make sure they're aware of some of these uh, things. And they can always find the information on hhs.gov forward slash coronavirus forward slash CARES Act provider relief funds. Uh, They can find it on accelerated and advanced payment fact sheets. And then for the payroll protection, the sba.gov funding dash program. So make sure that you are doing your due diligence and you're getting that done. Otherwise, it can definitely uh, be a problem. And we don't want you to have to deal with later on basically going bankrupt because you didn't know uh, what the rules were, but make sure that your uh, accounting team does. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because I think sometimes that can be a problem if people aren't on top of things. And I am just relentlessly organized and my accounting is so spot on. I mean, you could, I I know there's a phrase out there talked about when somebody cleans something, you can eat off their floors. You look at my accounting and you could basically eat off my floors. There's every penny accounted for only because I've been audited before. You know, I've been, been working for a long time and I think 20 years ago I was audited and I passed and then I was audited again 
uh, 10 years ago, just, you know, randomly. And I've even had one of the, the IRS people say, this is some of the cleanest accounting I've ever seen. I said, I am on top of it. So I want you to be on top of it as well. Otherwise, it can come back to be a problem. Okay, so our coding question today comes from one of the updated fact sheets for telehealth. And I really wanted to bring this to your attention only because this is a question that has come up to me, but this was actually documented on the 527-2020 uh, CMS fact sheet. So this is an important question. So it's question number 25, and they asked, if the video connection is disconnected during an audio video Medicare telehealth visit due to technological issues, can the visit still be billed as Medicare telehealth. So in effect, what was that person asking? They're saying if they didn't have video, can they still bill an office visit? So here's what Medicare said. They said, and it's actually documented on the 527. It says practitioners should report this code that best describes the service. So they're saying we're holding you on your honor. If the service was furnished primarily through an audio only connection, practitioners should consider whether the telephone evaluation and management and assessment and management codes best describe the service. If the service was furnished primarily using audio video technology, then the practitioner should bill the appropriate code from the Medicare telehealth list, which would be office visits. And then they go on to describe what the uh, telemedicine or I should say the audio only codes 99441 to 443 are. But here's the most important uh, thing they say here. They talk about the fact that uh, they said we've added these telephone calls for when there is an issue that comes up for this purpose. So what they're re explaining basically is let's say that you plan to be on the phone with the patient, you've blocked 30 minutes and you started audio video and all of a sudden you can't uh, see the patient and their internet goes out, which happens. I've been on so many Zoom calls calls lately and um, doing webinars and doing I actually did a happy hour for a conference recently and somebody had lightning and thunder where they were and they couldn't get back on the call so it does happen using a video and audio or audio and video uh, it definitely pulls on your broadband and pulls on your um, your internet it's a lot different than just audio only so let's say again you had it scheduled and uh, it went out after five minutes and the call ended up being 30 minutes but it was only three through audio only. You're now looking at a 99443. You're not at a 992 anything. So make sure that you're not making that mistake. It's well documented and that you are not um, basically saying, well, this is how we started. So this is what we get to bill for. This isn't like, let's say, having a surgery where um, you basically didn't get to do it so got to put a 53 modifier because it was discontinued it's not like that you have to default to what it ended up being and this was right in the faq sheet another question that came up and this was updated again on 527 it said how can practitioners bill for audio only services that last longer than 30 minutes so they talked about this not only on number 30 in the question but they said on page 46 of the CARES Act, they said they talk about who can independently bill for services, but here is the quote they put in there. They said 99443 and codes 98968 for a qualified healthcare professional describe 21 to 30 minutes of medical discussion respectively for each practitioner type, but there are no CPT codes available to describe medical discussions lasting, lasting longer than 30 minutes. That's an important distinction because basically they just said if it's over 30 minutes, this is the code. So 21 minutes or more is the 99443 if it's an MD or DO or a mid-level provider. This is where you have to really be disciplined and not allow patients to keep you on the phone for an hour. If they're not going to utilize the audio and video platform that you have through your EMR or through they, what they're allowed on FaceTime or Skype or anything like that, Google Hangouts, whatever the option is, then you really have to say, okay, well then the most I can give you is a 30 minute phone call. Otherwise at that point, once you pass 30 minutes, it's on your dime. And now it, you're losing money from that point. And I have to talk about this in the business of medicine landscape. Otherwise, 
you're, you're basically getting an allowable of $110. And what you're doing is something that's worth a lot more than that. And so be aware of that, that you can't always allow the patients to dictate your time. Even though I'm sympathetic, I empathize with the situation. I know a lot of Medicare patients want to do phone calls only instead of the audio and visual. But you have to understand that that does limit your reimbursement. And there are things that you're going to be limited on. So our coding question was brought to you today by Modern Healthcare, the only healthcare business news weekly in digital and white paper format, Modern Healthcare Magazine, Chicago, Illinois. I really like this magazine. Um, there's a couple times when I've been a little bit annoyed with it, but only because some of their sponsors are not really who I like politically. And in some of you that know me at all know that I'm very vocal about my political pl- platform. I try not to bring it too much into the Codecast, but since it is a, a forum that I can I control, I sometimes I do, but I'm telling you, it's just, it's crazy out there right now what's going on. But if you ever want to look at a magazine that isn't just coding related, but just really has some good information of what's happening now, Modern Healthcare is uh, very helpful. So I wanted to give my personal tidbit this week and just do some shout outs because it has been a great couple of weeks with some of you loyal listeners and you've been so awesome to me. And you know, I, I want to shout out to Sonal on uh, LinkedIn. She's just a great resource and somebody I, I converse with quite a bit. Same with Jordan. And we're going to be doing a uh, platform where we're going to be doing a virtual conference coming up here shortly. Um, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and my YouTube reviews as well. Such a great month. And thank you to Earl and Tess for some just sweet and nice messages on my iTunes reviews. Uh, Earl, I can't believe you said that. You said I changed your life. That was just so nice. But a a special shout out to Christina Hernandez. Christina is uh, one of my Instagram um, friends, and she works for North Valley Eye Care. And and I just adore this lady. She's always so positive. She's just so nice all the time. But she sent me a cool t shirt. And it said babe support babes. And I was like, that is awesome. So Christina, thank you for that. And the sweet card there that was just so nice. And Ruth and Anoush and uh, Barbara Young, uh, Karen with a C. I know that you're working hard to get what you need to get done. Maureen, Holly, and all of you really, it's just it's been such a pleasure lately to um, talk to all of you and just really be able to connect with you, especially since we've been sequestered and or I know a lot of you have. And I know that's that's really tough sometimes. But I also wanted to shout out some of my, um, my Facebook people because oh, man, you guys have been just so great recently. And I just love it. So Jackie, and Bianca, and the Naples, Florida chapter APC, you guys are great. Uh, Nadia, and Menders. And let's see, Whitney, Armando, Cheryl, thank you so much for all of the kind comments. You laugh at my jokes. I have a Terry Fletcher Consulting uh, Facebook page, and all it does is I just post some random um, memes on codes and just, you know, trying to be a little bit humorous, trying to give you some light and airy things. So I appreciate you taking a look at that page. But everyone, I hope you have a better week, a good week, and I really hope that things start to settle down. I do want to make a statement, and I hope this is heard from everybody. You know, I think that this country is built on diversity, and I think it's important not only to support everyone, but to support uh, minority platforms, to support anyone who feels like they aren't heard based on the color of their skin, which is absolutely wrong. And I support anything that has to do with a, a, a peaceful protest, a, a voice out there saying what you believe, but that means you have to listen to everybody. So it's not just your voice, it's everybody's voice. And I hope soon we can come together and realize that we are one nation and that everyone should have an equal say in what happens and, and equal time as well. So I hope everyone uh, really finds some rest this week and hopefully some positive vibes and everybody make it a great day. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>